Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Hello Health. My name is Matt Law, and I hope you guys are enjoying your lunch hour uh, like I am with my morning coffee. And if I had food here, I'd be enjoying it with my favorite hot sauce. Uh, now, if you're like me, I eat a lot of hot sauce. I actually douse my food in hot sauce, and maybe I should even pour hot sauce in this mug with how much I eat it. But what we're going to talk about today is maybe my uh, eating habits are not healthy for me, and maybe I'm signing myself up for acid reflux or GERD, which is going to be the main topics for today. And we're going to be hearing about those uh, conditions from Dr. Michael Murray from Northern Nevada Medical Group. Now, before we dive into it, there's a few things I want to go through. First off, Hello Health. I know you guys are tuned in right now, but just for any newcomers who are coming to Hello Health this week, Hello Health is a way that we at Health Benefits Associates connect you with doctors here in Nevada. So this is where if you can't get out and see the doctor, we are able to bring you the doctor to your computer or phone in your home. And we have weekly presentations and actually we have another presentation tomorrow. So make sure to stay tuned for our next Hello Health presentations. And we also have a Mastering Medicare series that we are going live in two weeks uh, with. And I'll be kicking us off on September 15th. We will be discussing the top tips and tricks to help you master your own Medicare, like the Medicare advisors here at Health Benefits Associates. And we're going to be talking about Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Supplement plans, all the things that you need help with right in time for the Medicare annual enrollment period. Now, besides mastering Medicare and Hello Health, this YouTube channel is a very unique place on the internet. It is our informational hub for uh, instructional videos, Medicare uh, information, or healthcare updates. I'm sure all of you here in Nevada have seen that hospitals have been cutting contracts right and left, and we usually are up to date on these video uh, with these issues by posting videos on this channel. So, if you want to stay up to date with your healthcare or your Medicare here in Nevada, make sure to hit that subscribe button on the channel and ring the notification bell so you can get an update as to when we go live or have an update for you. Also, if you like this video, make sure to like the video by clicking the like button. That way we can bring you more videos like this in the future. Now, if you don't want to come onto the YouTube channel and get your information, you can always walk in our front door. Health Benefits Associates has offices in Reno, Sparks, and in Carson City. So you can come see me in person or one of our other Medicare or healthcare experts in town so you can find help for your insurance needs. Now, at the end of today's presentation with Dr. Michael Murray, we're gonna have something really special. We're gonna have a live Q&A. And that is where today we're actually, I'm in the studio right now talking to you in real time. This is not pre-recorded. this is live. And if you have questions for Dr. Murray or for myself, Leave them in the comments section below. We'll get to those towards the end of the presentation, so make sure to stay tuned until the very end. And a little bit weird, but YouTube sometimes asks to create a channel before you can ask your questions. Just click yes, create the channel, and that will allow you to leave your questions in the comment section below, which you can do at any time during today's presentation. Now let's talk about Dr. Michael Murray. Enough about the YouTube channel and about us. Let's Let's get into the expert of the day. Now, Dr. Michael Murray, if you're, in, if you're tuning in from Fallon, he actually might be a neighbor of yours. He lives in Fallon, but he practices at Northern Nevada Medical Group in Fallon and in Sparks. So also, if you go to the hospital on the hill in Sparks, you may have walked past him in the hallways. He practices there quite frequently. Um, and when I say he practices a lot, I really mean it. He recently achieved his 400th TIF procedure and for those of you who don't know, TIF procedure is an innovative proce procedure designed for patients with chronic acid reflux. So he really is there to help you prevent acid reflux, but if you do have it and you're tuning in today, he can help you treat it at the same time. Now enough about the, you know, the intros and all of this. I want to get Dr. Michael Murray on the line so we can hear what he has to say about acid reflux and GERD. Dr. Murray, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much, Matt. Perfect. So let's talk about 
gastroesophageal reflux disease and, and basically, you know, what it is, how did you get it, and, and what are the basically the therapeutic options we have available today uh, to treat it? Because uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, it's a very uh, changing field, uh, mostly because the number of people getting this is going up year by year. I've been doing uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease as kind of a specialty for over 10 years. When I first started out, uh, about 20% of the population of America uh, were considered to have reflux disease. And now it's up to 27, closer to 30%. So we're definitely going in the wrong direction uh, in terms of people getting the disease. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about you know, why do I have reflux? What's going on? How come I get this disease? And basically we know uh, anatomically there's a different components of a reflux barrier. We know that your stomach has acid in it. Acid's supposed to be there. Uh, it it's, does a lot of good things for you. It helps you begin the digestion process. It tends to kill uh, invading bacteria or other things that get into your GI tract before they have a chance to do anything evil. And so it's really important that that acid, however, just stay in the stomach. That organ is designed to handle the acid. When the acid gets up into the esophagus, it starts to cause erosions and issues with pain and discomfort. And that's because the lining of the esophagus is different. It's very much like the lining of your skin. It has a squamous lining as opposed to a glandular lining. And so as you expect, if you drift some acid on your skin, it wouldn't feel very good. And that's the same thing that happens in the esophagus. So the question is why this happens is because that mechanism that your body has uh, to prevent this starts to break down over time. We know that there's really two different types of sphincters or high pressure areas that keep the gastric contents in the stomach and not coming up. And the one is this sling of the diaphragm, the esophagus, and its path through the chest into the abdominal cavity has to pass through the diaphragm, which is the major respiratory muscle. And so that hole has to be fairly tight around the esophagus. The reason is because when you breathe, you drop your diaphragm down and you create negative pressure so that air goes into your lungs. But if that hole gets a little bit larger, you can get what's called a hiatal hernia, where the stomach now is sliding up into the chest every time you breathe. And so that kind of displaces the normal valve mechanism. Now, there's also a high pressure zone in the esophagus that's there all the time. And it's important that these two areas stay close together so that they can work in unison. And that's what usually prevents reflux from happening. Now, most of us start out having reflux as a kind of a warning sign. Your body's just telling you, hey, don't do this anymore, whether it's too much coffee, too much hot sauce, like Matt was talking about, or some kind of dietary thing you've done that your body didn't respond too well to, uh, such as overfilling the stomach, too much alcohol. And this is kind of how it starts. And then if you behave yourself a little bit, it goes away. But what you're doing every time you get this is causing a little bit more damage to the esophagus. We know that the length of that valve is very important. And every time you get these episodes, you may be killing a portion of that sphincter and, and shortening its length. And that starts to wear down over time. And so most people start out with this and maybe in their 20s or 30s. I'm seeing it in a lot younger population than we used to. We used to think this was a disease, you know, with a 40 or 50 year old guy with kind of a big gut that comes in and, and has a hiatal hernia and reflux was, was kind of the standard. But I'm seeing it in a lot younger patients now. And we don't know why that is, but it, it's almost invariably rated, related to the dietary habits of Americans, which have not gotten better uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. So that's why you get reflux. And, and so as you start to break this barrier down, you can't just go back and start behaving again. It starts to get reflux every time you eat. And so that's when you get what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease, where you have these episodes of three to four times a week, you're getting this terrible sensation of something's burning. Um, reflux disease can happen all the way up into the back of the throat. We call that laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, where you get throat issues. You can have issues with it getting into the lungs and getting aspiration pneumonia. 
So it can be a fairly serious disease. Now, generally, how people start managing this is they manage it on their own. They'll take some Tums or some bicarbonate, and that neutralizes the acid. So that's the first line of therapy most people try, and it's very effective. Uh, generally, it'll make you feel better. But again, as you shorten that valve or as the hernia gets larger, these things tend to not work as well. So there's different medications. And as we talk about this, it's good to talk about the history of how we treated this disease. Uh, a strong group of medications came out probably in the 70s and 80s called histamine receptor antagonists. And these medicines are basically Zantac, which has recently been taken off the market because it causes cancer, or Pepsid. I think Pepsid is basically the only one left out there that uh, you can get a prescription for or get it over the counter. And these medicines were eventually superseded uh, basically in the 90s uh, by these very powerful medications called proton pump inhibitors. And this is a class of drugs like Nexium or Prilosec or Protonics. There's a class of them, and there's all different type of ones, and insurances will pay for different ones. But most people end up on those uh, once they have the disease. And they're very common. Uh, they're often prescribed without any uh, real workup of the disease. If you go in and say, I get occasionally you get a, a reflux event, you'll be on these medications. And so we were very liberal uh, throughout the you know, 2000s and things of just making sure everyone was on these medications. We thought they were fairly safe. Uh, but as it turns out, um, these things are very strong. They shut down acid almost completely. And so you start getting the long-term side effects from that. It's good to have acid in your stomach. Every vertebrate animal has acid in its stomach. Uh, so turning that off creates some issues. There's a whole host of side effects now that we've seen over time, including risks of renal uh, problems, kidney failure, uh, even vascular issues, increased risk of uh, cardiac events, increased risk of strokes, increased risk of dementia. Again, since you don't have acid in your stomach, you have increased risk of getting infections in your GI tract. And there have been studies that show that COVID, uh, if you take these medicines, COVID is more likely uh, to infect you. So we're kind of trending back away from giving everyone just medications forever. And uh, even the drug companies state right on their you know, labels that you should only be given these things for eight weeks. And I see people all the time been on them for 10, 15, 20 years. And so we're kind of going away from just throwing these medicines at you all the time. And we've also learned a heck of a lot about the disease uh, going forward. Um, there were always surgical approaches as opposed to the medications, uh, but the, the surgical options weren't very good. They had an operation that came out in the 50s called the Nissen fundoplication, which kind of got perfected uh, over the course of 20, 30 years. But it's a... It's a very major reconstructive surgery in that region. It obliterates the fundus of the stomach. It's called a fundoplication. And as it turns out, we learn that that fundus of the stomach, the stomach is shaped that way for a reason. This fundus handles gas uh, in your stomach. So and it communicates with the esophagus to allow you to burp and, and vent gas out of your stomach. So what we found out, these patients that had that operation got this complication called gas bloat where they couldn't burp very well, they couldn't vomit, they were uncomfortable after eating, and sometimes it gave them trouble swallowing too, what we call dysphagia. So these had side effects, and so we've always kind of been looking for that uh, kind of a golden mean between these medicines that have their side effects and surgery that has its side effects. There's just something halfway in the middle that we could do. And so other options became available. One is uh, one that I'm very interested in and have practiced a lot is called TIF or transoral incisionless fundoplication in which you, you would still fix a hiatal hernia laparoscopically if you have one because that is an important part of any correction of reflux. But then you can do a kind of a less invasive fundoplication from inside, which has a lot less side effect profile. So the side effect profile, you don't get the reflux, you don't get the you know, problems with handling gas, you're still able to burp, you're still able to vomit, and you don't get the problems with long-term trouble swallowing. So it's a little bit easier for most patients to take. There are other options that came out as well called magnetic sphincter augmentation. This is a, a 
bracelet you put around the esophagus, basically of magnets that kind of open and close. But there's, that's a very limited uh, number of patients that, that can have that. They have to have a lot of testing to be sure that they don't have any issues with swallowing. So these are kind of the treatment paradigms uh, that we have been in. And like I said, for a long time, we were in the conundrum of just throw medicines at it or if you wait real long time till your disease was really bad and then do surgery. So now with these newer steps, we can intervene earlier. Uh, people are averse to being on a medication for a long time, afraid about side effects. There's options to treat. So in terms of that, we now start looking at working people up. We don't, um, again, in the 90s, we would just, you come in and we throw medicines at you and just not even worry about it. You'd be on medicines for a long time. I think if you've been on medicines for a long time, it's sometimes good to seek out some attention, get an endoscopy, see if you really need to be on these medicines. There's all kinds of tests we can do now to work you up to see exactly what's going on. Even though a lot of people have reflux, the reasons they have them are different. I mean, you can have some people with really bad hiatal hernias and terrible esophagitis, and they may not even feel all their symptoms. Then you have other people that have a very sensitive esophagus, their disease isn't that bad, and they don't need to be on the medicines all the time. So what I do is, is kind of work people up to see why they have reflux, other problems that can cause reflux or motility issues of the esophagus. Your esophagus knows what to do when it gets reflux. You should be able to swallow and get that little bit of acid back in the stomach so it doesn't stay there long periods of time. Some people don't have that ability. Other people have blockages in their stomach, a disease is called gastroparesis that doesn't let their stomach empty, so they get this chronic backwash reflux. And so it's really important when you're looking at someone that, that has reflux, it's really determine what is the problems this person has that you can address. I mean, what's really causing their reflux? And so you have to be very thorough in working, the, working people up that with reflux before you consider operating on them. There's a, like I said, there's a range of operations you can do from, you know, TIF, which is a very minimally invasive thing without any hiatal hernia repair to still doing an innocent fund application. So it's, it's not as easy as maybe Larry the cable guy who's driving his truck saying, just take your pills and don't get heartburn in the first place. As it turns out, the medications just kind of hide your symptoms. And they let you continue the kind of the bad habits that are causing reflux. So sometime down the line, you're going to be paying the price for that. So it's important to understand why you get the disease. Like I said, it's generally overeating, overfilling, starting to break down your reflux barrier. Medications are usually the first line of therapy. Almost everyone takes medications first. Uh, it's important to realize that medications are not just a free lunch. They do have side effects. They will let you to continue behaviors that are causing the reflux. Uh, and then sometime down the line, you may be seeing a guy like me. Reflux is not always benign. It can have a lot of uh, you know, side effects over time that are not good. We know that reflux is the main cause of esophageal cancer in this country. And esophageal cancer was the number one rising cancer in this country for many years, and it's still very, very much on the increase. And so any more, we know that if we can control that reflux or get to you before you turn into this disease called Barrett's esophagus, uh, we can decrease your risk of getting esophageal cancer by monitoring you. So that's one of the things no one really tells you when you're taking these medicines. You may be hiding a disease called Barrett's esophagus, which is a pre-malignant lesion. And so if you have that, you want to know. So we're starting to do, if you're first getting your first screening colonoscopy at age 50 or 55, and you've been on these medications five to 10 years, it's good to ask your physician that's doing the colonoscopy to go ahead and do an upper endoscopy to make sure you don't have that disease. Other side effects or problems with reflux, it can cause strictures, uh, and that, that'll give you trouble swallowing. Um, so these are kind of the warning signs, like your disease has gone on beyond what the pills are going to do for you. So it, it kind of the, the really things that make us nervous as physicians, if you have reflux for a long time, 
and you start having trouble swallowing. So if you're seeing your spouse or someone doing this number after they're eating and trying to get things down, that's time to bring them in and see a physician and, and make sure that things haven't progressed onto a stricture or maybe a tumor. So with that, I think it, it's super important not just to, I think we have a, you know, in this country, a thing, ah, it's just some reflux, don't worry about it. But again, when you start seeing people with esophageal cancer, realize it's, it's a very significant disease. And in fact, is most of the people or at least 40% that show up with esophageal cancer, never really thought they had reflux that bad. They come in, they end up with esophageal cancer, which is a, a terrible cancer. And they never really felt they had reflux enough to, to worry about it. So again, we're kind of moving away from this, just throw pills at everybody and hope they do well. Uh, if you've been on these things five, 10 years, it may be time to take a look and see if it's, it's time to get off, time to decrease the dose if we can, or to get tested. And so let me, talk a little bit about the testing we do uh, to look at reflux. So one of the major tests that you get is an upper endoscopy, but it, it doesn't tell me enough about your disease. What you do with the upper endoscopy is we'll, we'll knock you out and kind of just move in there with a scope and take a look at the anatomy, but we can't tell how things work. So we kind of like to do a physiologic test called a pH test where I implant a chip in your esophagus. This tells me how long your reflux it stays in there for two, three days. It'll record every time your reflux. And we can really see how bad your reflux is. So sometimes it's good to get some, some physiologic testing, not just look at it. And so that would be my advice to people. If you're having reflux for a long period of time, the pills don't seem to be working because in some people it is a progressive disease. Uh, get in and get checked. It's not always a benign process. The medications have their own set of side effects. And it's kind of an exciting field. There's newer things coming out every year in this disease in terms of treating it uh, in a minimally invasive fashion. So I think with that, I'll, I'll put it back to, to Matt and see, see what he has for me. If there's any questions out there, you can ask some more questions, Matt. <laughs> well, I, I that was, first off, that was a great presentation. I felt like you were talking to me. I actually may need to schedule an appointment with you. <laughs> I, I definitely have too much hot sauce, so um, yeah, there's always I'm a little concerned. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to that because I actually have a few questions myself. Okay. Um, and we do actually have a good amount of questions in the Q&A. Um, so first off, I just want to let everyone know who's watching right now. Uh, you still have time to ask questions. So if you want, if you have a question, leave it in the comment section below. I will see it here on my laptop and I will be able to ask Dr. Murray so we can get an answer to you in real time. Um, I also see that a uh, few people like the video, so we really appreciate that. And Jimmy says, hi, Matt. So Jimmy, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, now, Dr. Murray, we're going to dive into this q and I'm actually going to start us off because obviously I have the hot sauce on the desk. So I have some hot sauce questions and All right. they're a little bit spicy. So first off, um, I like to rate and test hot sauces. It's just like my personal uh, hobby, I guess you could call it. I, I, so it sounds like I shouldn't be taking Tums. Maybe I should just be limiting the amount of hot sauce I take, like maybe once a week. Or what do you think is like a good frequency to do that? Yeah, so moderation is great, right? Moderation is, is really important in this disease. I mean, really, this is a disease of abundance. This is, you only see this disease really bad in, in, in Western countries where food is available all the time. We're never in an unfed state, basically. Uh, and we always tend to, our tendency is to supersize everything, right? So every time you go to a restaurant, there's more food on there, more food, and you tend to finish it off. So this is, part of this is stretching out that area of the stomach and, and being full all the time. Uh, that, it increases pressure in your stomach and it increases the ability uh, for that high pressure in the stomach to, to overcome the valve, right? Other chemical things that, that do this, there's, you know, that high pressure zone can be loosened up a little bit by certain chemicals. One of them is caffeine, uh, the other is alcohol. Uh, hot sauce generally is probably more of a chemical burn, so that can happen as well. So in certain countries where they drink very hot liquids, Turkey, for instance, uh, they 
drink very hot teas there, that can cause damage to the valve too, right? So you can have mechanical uh, problems from drinking too hot of fluids or, or having chemicals like capsaicin, which is in hot peppers, that can cause damage directly to that area. So, yeah, so moderation would be the first step in, in, in treating this, just knowing that generally this is your body telling you, I'm overdoing it. I got to take a break. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of telling people that inter intermittent fasting is good, where you skip a meal, you don't have your stomach distended all the time. Uh, so, again, alcohol, caffeine, some of these hot sauces. There's other triggers that happen, like tomatoes, cucumbers, chocolate. It's another one that tend to people get reflux from. Each one, everyone's just a little bit different on their triggers. Huh. <laughs> I feel like you're just like almost like critiquing my entire diet. I love tomatoes <laughs> too. So I, I actually, so I actually came up with another question and we will get to everyone's questions here in a second. Um, obviously this is just like a hot topic for me since I'm the hot sauce guy in the office. Um, when you said hot drinks versus cold drinks, so would you say that maybe cold brew coffee is less, um, it, it puts less pressure on your stomach lining than hot coffee? Sure. So, you know, very hot liquids, do cause this. And I've seen patients who come in who they're very similar. They, they drink hot water with lemon in it. Some women will do this and it, they'll have a very, uh, you know, significant uh, kind of reaction to that over time. And it kind of does the same thing as reflux does. It, it tends to beat down that valve. So, you know, if you do colder drinks would be better, uh, but you still, if you're just Drinking caffeine, that'll still lower the, the pressure in your, your sphincter, your lower esophageal sphincter. So caffeine's bad. If you do decaffeinated cold brew, that'd be best. Okay. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those people where if you're drinking coffee, it better have a purpose, like keeping I hear you, you awake the rest I, of the I'm days. a coffee drinker, so I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm actually seeing a question from Jimmy. Uh, I, th I think this is the same Jimmy that shouted out to me. Uh, he actually asked the same question if iced coffee is better than hot coffee. So Jimmy, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, but once again, Jimmy, per Dr. Michael Murray, uh, maybe limit the amount of coffee that you're having uh, in general because moderation is key when it comes to anything in health. Um, now let's take a look at some of the other questions we have from our audience. Uh, looks like we have Bethy here who's asking, uh, why is there an increase of people getting the disease? Yeah, so part of it's the obesity epidemic. Uh, so we know uh, if you're obese, your chances of getting reflux is much higher. And we, we actually have this scale we use, kind of like a Demeester scale. And if you, we know that if you drop your weight, your reflux scale will go down as well. So uh, having too much pressure in your abdomen, overeating, overfeeding, these issues are what cause it. And, and again, I don't know, it's just not always obese patients. It's, and I see it in younger patients uh, that, that get this disease. I, I, my guess is it's something uh, in the diet that we have. I don't think our diet's very good, processed foods and everything. Uh, but you see it in Europe too. There's some countries that don't have it very much uh, and, and others that do. It's kind of like the Northern European, England has a, a very high incidence of this disease. Uh, but it's, it's related to being always in a fed state. I mean, if, if you never feel hungry or the minute you get a hungry pang, you're on your way to the refrigerator, that's, that's part of the problem. Interesting. I also didn't know that it was more of a geographical-based uh, thing, but also, that also makes sense because eating habits or, um, you know, how people culturally, um, you know, handle their meals and foods, uh, I guess, varies from country to country. So it is. No, I, I always thought, I went to Spain and they eat very late there, and I figured, I don't know understand how these people eat at nine o'clock at night and then go to bed and don't get reflux and so i looked it up and as it turns out they don't get really bad reflux over there so a lot of europeans eat very late at night and then go lay down that's the exact opposite of what we tell people to do in this country but i think they have they, for most of the day they don't have big meals that they have one big meal and that's it so we tend to have more than one big meal a day and, and so we we tend to Put a lot of pressure on the stomach and on that area of the lower esophageal sphincter. Makes sense. Every time I go to the restaurant, I feel like I always have to get a to-go box. So yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. Next question comes from Alex. 
Uh, if I get acid reflux, will it go away on its own, or does he? Do you have it for life? Yes. So about twenty-seven percent of people have GERD, which means reflux three or four times a week. It's kind of a waxing, waning type of uh, disease. So they did studies in Germany uh, called a pro-GERD study, where they just went into doctor's offices and took 5,000 people that were experiencing reflux, and they just scoped them at two years, five years, just followed how, the, how they did. And so there's a certain percentage that will continue to progress, which means they'll eventually their disease will get worse than what the pills can handle. And that's maybe like 15, 20% over, over a long period of time. Generally, your body does know what to do when you get a reflux episode. You don't necessarily have to take medicines. When you feel reflux, your body will produce saliva. And saliva has bicarbonate in it. It's almost like a, a Tums for yourself. You'll swallow that bicarbonate. will help neutralize the acid. And you'll push the acid back into your stomach. And it'll, it'll tend to go away. Uh, so it, it doesn't usually cause it what we call a rose of esophagitis when you first start getting it. That only happens when the valve is, is kind of really starting to get beat down. Uh, so, yeah, generally it, it, it'll go away. It's self-limited disease initially. But over time, if you don't change your ways and if things get worse, the hiatal hernia gets larger or the kind of this ligament that holds it all together gets looser, uh, your reflux will get worse. And that happens, like I said, in about 20% 20, 20 of people that experience reflux. It'll go on and on and they keep getting worse and worse. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, and we have a few more questions. I know we, uh, you know, we don't want to keep you too long, uh, Dr. Mary. I know that you That's have okay. a busy schedule. Um, we have a uh, question from JF. I'm assuming those are your initials. Um, I am having an endoscopy tomorrow morning. Sounds like this is a very timely presentation. Yeah, right. Uh, for the last 10 days, I have had trouble belching, and when I cough occasionally, I expel clear mucus. Any thoughts? Yeah, so these are so these are tough. So sometimes you do get this reflux that causes symptoms in the back of the throat. It's very hard for us, and especially like in Reno area now where there's all this smoke, people have kind of damage to their aerodigestive tract just from the smoke. So your body's producing mucus, which is this clear secretion that you may be seeing, but you can get that in response to acid as well. There are some tests you can do for that. There's a, a specific test um, called a res tech where they put this catheter in your nose and there's a little catheter that stays in your throat to see if acids are coming up that high. Uh, so there's, there's ways to see if that's what's happening. It's really hard to diagnose. Um, if you're having an upper endoscopy, that's really not going to tell you. You can take a look there, and it can look inflamed, but it, the information could be from sinusitis, could be from infections, could be allergies, could be smoke in the air or other uh, pollutants. So it's, it's important to really have that figured out. I, I'm really reluctant to kind of guarantee people after an anti-reflux procedure, all that will go away. We do know that if you look at all comers, if, if you do this, Well, it looks like we may be having some technical difficulties on our end, um, and I know that you guys have a lot of questions. I'm looking in the Q&A. There is a lot of questions for Dr. Michael Murray, and um, not a problem. We will actually reach out to Dr. Murray and get those answers for you um, so you can stay up to date with your health and health care, especially when it comes to G or GERD and acid reflux, uh, which, like I said earlier, I may need to tone it down on the hot sauce. Um, I like hot sauce too much to stop completely, but I think the big tip of the day from Dr. Murray is moderation is key. So make sure to moderate your coffee, um, your hot sauce, and if you need any advice on GERD or acid reflux, make sure to reach out to Dr. Murray at one of his clinics in Fallon or in Sparks. He will be able to help you out. We have his contact information in the description of this video, so make sure to reach out to him and schedule an appointment. Being proactive is everything in healthcare. Now, that was the rest of the presentation. I know that 
I don't know what happened. I think we lost connection. Uh, maybe there's some issue with the smoke and the Wi-Fi. But uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is our next presentation with Hello Health, which is actually tomorrow. Uh, we have Dr. Bashou, uh talking about the new geriatric facility uh, that's actually going to be on Kitsky Lane in Reno, uh, right, about, right around that roundabout, um, if you know where that is. That will be opening on January 1st of next year. So we definitely want to, um, and I'm actually, I'm, ge I'm getting word from our producers here that we're reconnected with Sorry. Dr. Murray. And Dr. Murray, we have you on screen. I know that uh, we had some technical difficulties and yes. not a problem. We're going to, if you have some time, can we get through a few more of these questions? I see some good questions Absolutely. here on the screen. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, it <laughs> looks like you're actually in the, the exam room right now. <laughs> I know. I'm back in a, another room, so I had to get a charger for this thing. <laughs> not, not a problem. I mean, maybe you should be uh, taking our blood pressure while you're in there. <laughs> you got all the equipment there. Um, now I'm going to dive into a few more questions because okay. it looks like we have someone else. I know that JF, um, your initials, I know you asked that question. I think we answered that. Um, we have another question from Deborah. Um, this also seems to be a timely question. Uh, she is saying, I have been treated for Shatsky ring. My doctor has prescribed omeprazole 20 milligrams. They recommended taking it one hour before in the morning. Can I take this at a different time? Yes, you can take it at a different time, but it is recommended that you take it on an empty stomach. That's why they always tell you to take this medication in the morning. Um, so, you know, if you haven't eaten in an hour, you can take it before bed. Sometimes people that have nocturnal issues, and this is one of the things I see a lot when it starts keeping people up at night, they start coming in to see me. Uh, but sometimes it's best to take it uh, before, before bed. If you fast a little bit before bed, uh, taking it before bed is, is fine too, and it may be more efficacious if you're getting nocturnal symptoms. So yeah, you don't necessarily have to take it in the morning. Uh, 20 milligrams is a pretty low uh, dose. So if you have a Schatzky's ring, kind of what they're saying is you have a hiatal hernia. Schatzky's ring always happens just above a hiatal hernia, and sometimes it can cause trouble swallowing, and they have to dilate it. And every time they dilate it, it makes the, that valve less competent. So, so I hope that helps you. But you can take your medications. As long as you take them on an empty stomach, they'll still be uh, good. I, again, if you're having nighttime symptoms, sometimes better to take it before bed. Perfect. And Deborah, I hope that answered your question. And if you have questions like that in the future, don't be afraid to reach out to Dr. Murray. He is obviously the expert in this. Um, now we're going to get to a few more questions. There's, there is a lot of questions here that um, I will personally answer after this presentation, but I think let's, let's get a, maybe one or two more here. Sure. Uh, looks like Bethy has a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to, try and sum up all of her questions into one okay. giant string. Uh, so first, uh, multiple part question, how can stress contribute to GERD and can someone manage their diagnosis without giving up alcohol, hot sauce, or coffee? <laughs> yes, as long as, so I'll go, I'll go to that, the last one first, right? So you don't have to live like a monk necessarily just because you have reflux disease, but you have to realize you have this problem uh, that your valve is going to get, you know, it, it's just going to end up being overcome if you go too far. So again, maybe instead of like doing a, you know, double extra large coffee in the morning, you might want to decrease the volume there. And the same is true of alcohol. Maybe instead, instead of doing, you know, a whiskey or some hard alcohol, maybe a beer or a glass of wine would be better. So I think, you know, just kind of dial it down a notch. Uh, this is a society, society likes to eat and drink. It's, it's, you know, that's why I try to, when I fix these valves, I try to make it so it's not a huge encumbrance on your life. I mean, so you want to give you, get your life back, but you know, if you're going to go out uh, to wing stop and get a big, huge 24, super hot wings and a six pack and, and have at it, you're going to get reflux. You just, just got to realize you're going to pay a price for that. So, so I would start there basically is, is, is you have to have some element of moderation uh, if you have reflux disease, otherwise you're going to pay the price. What was the first part of that question? 
Oh, the, oh, the first part was how can stress contribute to GERD? Yeah, so it's been a stressful year, right, with COVID and everything. So uh, stress, chronic stress does increase uh, your acid production in your stomach. Uh, it also gives you these senses in your chest, the almost like this butterfly feeling. So then you don't know if that's reflux again or whether it's just you're anxious about things. Uh, so it, there are physiologic uh, responses to stress, like you increase your cortisol, you don't get good sleep and other things that, that kind of feed on reflux as well. So you also, when you get these stress hormones, for some reason you want to eat more. And so they've shown like if you have bad night's sleep, the next day you generally eat 400, 500 calories more. So then you're overfilling the stomach and it gets to be a vicious cycle. You tend to try and, you know, comfort food. You try to comfort yourself by eating and that's, that makes things worse too. So that's another reason why stress gets you if you have reflux. Makes sense. And I think we're going to wrap it up for today. I know there's a handful of other questions and I do appreciate, uh, you know, all the questions from everyone today. Um, so thank you for tuning in uh, to the Q&A. I also want to thank Dr. Murray for a great presentation and answering all these questions for us. So Dr. Murray, we hope to see you in the future and all right. we appreciate Absolutely. your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Murray. Oh. All right. So I'm glad that we got to finish that Q&A. Uh, it sounds like a lot of you are really interested in this topic. And if you liked the topic today, make sure to like the video so we can bring you more of this in the future. And maybe, hey, maybe we'll have Dr. Murray on for a part two Hello Health presentation in the future. Now, like we talked about, Hello Health will be going on for the next couple of weeks. We have a presentation tomorrow with Dr. Bashow who will be talking about that new geriatric facility on Kitsky Lane in Reno. And that opens on January 1st. I also want to remind you guys about our Mastering Medicare series starting on September 15th. And I will be kicking us off, and you'll be seeing me again on YouTube Live, just like you did today, talking about the top tips and tricks and insider information for you to become a Medicare expert just like me, just in time for the annual enrollment period. And if you want any information on Hello Health, Mastering Medicare, or any of the in-person events that our office, Health Benefits Associates, is doing, click on the link in the description below. It'll take you to our website on the seminars page where you can view all of the uh, doctors, topics, and schedule. Now, I had a lot of fun today. I'm actually going to go get lunch. I'm starving. I've had too much coffee today. And I'm going to tone it down on the hot sauce. Uh, so hopefully you guys took some notes and hopefully you are taking some tips from Dr. Murray to take care of your health. My name is Matt Law with Health Benefits Associates and we'll see you tomorrow at noon.